The 9-11 Commission Report, Chapter 7.4, Final Strategies and Tactics. Final Preparations in the United States. During the early summer of 2001, Atta, assisted by Shahi, was busy coordinating the arrival of most of the muscle hijackers in southern Florida, picking them up at the airport, finding them places to stay, and helping them settle in the United States. The majority settled in Florida. Some opened bank accounts, acquired mailboxes, and rented cars. Several also joined local gyms, presumably to stay fit for the operation. Upon first arriving, most stayed in hotels and motels, but by mid-June they settled in shared apartments relatively close to one another and Atta. Though these muscle hijackers did not travel much after arriving in the United States, two of them, Walid al-Sheri and Satam al sakami took unusual trips. On May 19th, Sheri and Sakami flew from Fort Lauderdale to Freeport, the Bahamas, where they had reservations at the Bahamas Princess Resort. The two were turned away by Bahamian officials on arrival, however, because they lacked visas. They returned to Florida that same day. They likely took this trip to renew Sukami's immigration status, as Sukami's legal stay in the United States ended May 21st. On July 30th, Cherie traveled alone from Fort Lauderdale to Boston. He flew to San Francisco the next day, where he stayed one night before returning via Las Vegas. While this travel may have been a casing flight, Cherie traveled in first class on the same type of aircraft he would help hijack on September 11th, a Boeing 767, and the trip included a layover in Las Vegas. Cherie was neither a pilot nor a plot leader, as were the other hijackers who took surveillance flights. The three Hamburg pilots, Atta, Shahi, and Jarrah, took the first of their cross-country surveillance flights early in the summer. Shahi flew from New York to Las Vegas via San Francisco in late May. Jarrah flew from Baltimore to Las Vegas via Los Angeles in early June. Atta flew from Boston to Las Vegas via San Francisco at the end of June. Each traveled in first class on United Airlines. For the east-west transcontinental leg, each operative flew on the same type of aircraft he would pilot on September 11th. Atta and Shahi, a Boeing 767, Jarrah, a Boeing 757. Hanjur and Hazmi, as noted below, took similar cross-country surveillance flights in August. Jarrah and Hanjur also received additional training and practice flights in the early summer. A few days before departing on his cross-country test flight, Jarrah flew from Fort Lauderdale to Philadelphia, where he trained at Hortman Aviation and asked to fly the Hudson Corridor, a low-altitude hallway along the Hudson River that passes New York landmarks like the World Trade Center. Heavy traffic in the area can make the corridor a dangerous route for an inexperienced pilot. Because Hortman deemed Jarrah unfit to fly solo, he could fly this route only with an instructor. Hanjour, too, requested to fly the Hudson Corridor about this same time at Air Fleet Training Systems in Teterboro, New Jersey, where he started receiving ground instruction soon after settling in the area with Hazmi. Hanjour flew the Hudson Corridor, but his instructor declined a second request because of what he considered Hanjour's poor piloting skills. Shortly thereafter, Hanjour switched to Caldwell Flight Academy in Fairfield, New Jersey, where he rented small aircraft on several occasions during June and July. In one such instance on July 20th, Han Jur, likely accompanied by Hazmi, rented a plane from Caldwell and took a practice flight from Fairfield to Gaithersburg, Maryland, a route that would have allowed them to fly near Washington, D.C. Other evidence suggests that Han Jur may even have returned to Arizona for flight simulator training earlier in June. There is no indication that Atta or Shahi received any additional flight training in June. Both were likely too busy organizing the newly arrived muscle hijackers and taking their cross-country surveillance flights. Atta, moreover, needed to coordinate with his second-in-command, Nawaf al-Hazmi. Although Atta and Hazmi appear to have been in Virginia at about the same time in early April, they probably did not meet then. Analysis of late April communications associated with KSM indicates that they had wanted to get together in April, but could not coordinate the meeting. Atta and Hazmi probably first met in the United States only when Hazmi traveled round trip from Newark to Miami between June 19th and June 25th. 
After he returned to New Jersey, Hasby's behavior began to closely parallel that of the other hijackers. He and Hounsjour, for instance, soon established new bank accounts, acquired a mailbox, rented cars, and started visiting a gym. So did the four other hijackers who evidently were staying with them in New Jersey. Several also obtained new photo identification, first in New Jersey and then at the Virginia Department of Motor Vehicles, where Hosmi and Hanjour had obtained such documents months earlier, likely with help from their Jordanian friend, Rababa. Atta probably met again with Hosmi in early July. Returning from his initial cross-country surveillance flight, Atta flew into New York. Rather than return immediately to Florida, he checked into a New Jersey hotel. He picked up tickets to travel to Spain at a travel agency in Patterson on July 4th before departing for Fort Lauderdale. Now that the muscle hijackers had arrived, he was ready to meet with Ramsey ben al Sheib for the last time. The Meeting in Spain After meeting with Atta in Berlin in January 2001, Ben al Sheib had spent much of the spring of 2001 in Afghanistan and Pakistan, helping move the muscle hijackers as they passed through Karachi. During the Berlin meeting, the two had agreed to meet later in the year in Kuala Lumpur to discuss the operation in person again. In late May, Ben al Sheib reported directly to bin Laden at an al-Qaeda facility known as Compound 6 near Kandahar. Bin Laden told Ben al Sheib to instruct Atta and the others to focus on their security and that of the operation, and to advise Atta to proceed as planned with the targets discussed before Atta left Afghanistan in early 2000, the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, the White House, and the Capitol. According to Ben al Sheib, Bin Laden said he preferred the White House over the Capitol, asking Ben al Sheib to confirm that Atta understood this preference. Ben al Sheib says Bin Laden had given the same message to Walid al Sheri for conveyance to Atta earlier that spring. Ben al Sheib also received permission to meet Atta in Malaysia. Atef provided money for the trip, which KSM would help Ben al Sheib arrange in Karachi. In early June, Ben al Sheib traveled by taxi from Kandahar to Keda, Pakistan, where Al Qaeda courier Abu Rama took him to KSM. According to Ben al Sheib, KSM provided a plane ticket to Malaysia and a fraudulent Saudi passport to use for the trip. KSM told him to ask Atta to select a date for the attacks. Ben al Sheib was to return to Germany and then inform KSM of the date. KSM also gave Ben al Sheib the email address of Zarkarius Musawi for future contact. Ben al Sheib then left for Kuala Lumpur. Ben al Sheib contacted Atta upon arriving in Malaysia and found a change in plan. Atta could not travel because he was too busy helping the new arrivals settle in the United States. After remaining in Malaysia for approximately three weeks, Ben al Sheib went to Bangkok for a few days before returning to Germany. He and Atta agreed to meet later at a location to be determined. In early July, Atta called Ben al Sheib to suggest meeting in Madrid for reasons Ben al Sheib claims not to know. He says he preferred Berlin, but that he and Atta knew too many people in Germany and feared being spotted together. Unable to buy a ticket to Madrid at the height of the tourist season, Ben al Sheib booked a seat on a flight to Rias near Barcelona the next day. Atta was already en route to Madrid, so Ben al Sheib phoned Shahi in the United States to inform him of the change in itinerary. Atta arrived in Madrid on July 8th. He spent the night in a hotel and made three calls from his room, most likely to coordinate with Ben al Sheib. The next day, Atta rented a car and drove to Rias to pick up Ben al Sheib. The two then drove to the nearby town of Cambrils. Hotel records show Atta renting rooms in the same area until July 19th, when he returned his rental car in Madrid and flew back to Fort Lauderdale. On July 16th, Ben al Sheib returned to Hamburg using a ticket Atta had purchased for him earlier that day. According to Ben al Sheib, they did not meet with anyone else while in Spain. Ben al Sheib says he told Atta that Bin Laden wanted the attacks carried out as soon as possible. Bin Laden, Ben al Sheib conveyed, was worried about having so many operatives in the United States. Atta replied that he could not yet provide a date because he was too busy organizing the arriving hijackers and still needed to coordinate the timing of the flights so that the crashes would occur simultaneously. Atta said he required about five to six weeks before he could provide an attack date. 
Ben Alsheeb advised Atta that Bin Laden had directed that the other operatives not be informed of the date until the last minute. Atta was to provide Ben Alsheeb with advance notice of at least a week or two so that Ben Alsheeb could travel to Afghanistan and report the date personally to Bin Laden. As to targets, Atta understood Bin Laden's interest in striking the White House. Atta said he thought this target too difficult but had tasked Hazmi and Hanjour to evaluate its feasibility and was awaiting their answer. Atta said that those two operatives had rented small aircraft and flown reconnaissance flights near the Pentagon. Atta explained that Hanjour was assigned to attack the Pentagon, Jarrah the capital, and that both Atta and Shahi would hit the World Trade Center. If any pilot could not reach his intended target, he was to crash the plane. If Atta could not strike the World Trade Center, he planned to crash his aircraft directly into the streets of New York. Atta told Ben El Sheeb that each pilot had volunteered for his assigned target and that the assignments were subject to change. During the Spain meeting, Atta also mentioned that he had considered targeting a nuclear facility he had seen during familiarization flights near New York, a target they referred to as electrical engineering. According to Ben El Sheeb, the other pilots did not like the idea. They thought a nuclear target would be difficult because the airspace around it was restricted, making reconnaissance flights impossible, and increasing the likelihood that any plane would be shot down before impact. Moreover, unlike the approved targets, this alternative had not been discussed with senior al-Qaeda leaders and therefore did not have the requisite blessing. Nor would a nuclear facility have particular symbolic value. Atta did not ask Ben al Sheeb to pass this idea on to Bin Laden, Atef, or KSM, and Ben Al Sheeb says he did not mention it to them until after September 11th. Ben Al Sheeb claims that during their time in Spain, he and Atta also discussed how the hijackings would be executed. Atta said he, Shahi, and Jarrah had encountered no problems carrying box cutters on cross country surveillance flights. The best time to storm the cockpit would be about 10 to 15 minutes after takeoff, when the cockpit doors typically were open for the first time. Atta did not believe they would need any other weapons. He had no firm contingency plan in case the cockpit door was locked. While he mentioned general ideas such as using a hostage or claiming to have a bomb, he was confident the cockpit doors would be opened and did not consider breaking them down a viable idea. Atta told Ben Al Sheeb he wanted to select planes departing on long flights because they would be full of fuel and that he wanted to hijack Boeing aircraft because he believed them easier to fly than Airbus aircraft which he understood had an autopilot feature that did not allow them to be crashed into the ground. Finally, Atta confirmed that the muscle hijackers had arrived in the United States without incident. They would be divided into teams according to their English-speaking ability. That way they could assist each other before the operation and each team would be able to command the passengers in English. According to Ben Al-Sheeb, Atta complained that some of the hijackers wanted to contact their families to say goodbye, something he had forbidden. Atta, moreover, was nervous about his future communications with Ben Al-Sheeb, whom he instructed to obtain new telephones upon returning to Germany. Before Ben Al-Sheeb left Spain, he gave Atta eight necklaces and eight bracelets that Atta had asked him to buy when he was recently in Bangkok, believing that if the hijackers were clean-shaven and well-dressed, others would think them wealthy Saudis and give them less notice. As directed upon returning from Spain, Ben Al-Sheeb obtained two new phones, one to communicate with Atta and another to communicate with KSM and others, such as Zacharias Musawi. Ben Al-Sheeb soon contacted KSM and, using code words, reported the results of his meeting with Atta. This important exchange occurred in mid-July. The conversation covered various topics. For example, Jarrah was to send Ben Al-Sheeb certain personal materials from the hijackers including copies of their passports, which Ben Al-Sheeb in turn would pass along to KSM, probably for subsequent use in Al-Qaeda propaganda. The most significant part of the mid-July conversation concerned Jarrah's troubled relationship with Atta. KSM and Ben Al-Sheeb both acknowledged that Jarrah chafed under Atta's authority over him. Ben Al-Sheeb believes the disagreement arose in part from Jarrah's family visits. Moreover, Jarrah had been on his own for most of his time in the United States because Ben Al-Sheeb's visa difficulty had prevented the two of them from training together. Jarrah thus felt excluded from the decision-making. Ben Al-Sheeb had to act as a broker between Jarrah and Atta. 
Concerned that Jarrah might withdraw from the operation at this late stage, KSM emphasized the importance of Atta and Jarrah's resolving their differences. Ben Alshib claims that such concern was unwarranted, and in their mid-July discussion reassured KSM that Atta and Jarrah would reconcile and be ready to move forward in about a month after Jarrah visited his family. Noting his concern and the potential for delay, KSM at one point instructed Ben Alshib to send the skirts to Sally, a coded instruction to Ben Alshib to send funds to Zacharias Musawi. While Ben Alshib admits KSM did direct him to send Musawi money during the mid-July conversation, he denies knowing exactly why he received this instruction, though he thought the money was being provided within the framework of the 9-11 operation. KSM may have instructed Ben Alshib to send money to Musawi in order to help prepare Musawi as a potential substitute pilot for Jarrah. On July 20, 2001, Eisel Singwin, Jarrah's girlfriend, purchased a one-way ticket for Jarrah from Miami to Dusseldorf. On Jarrah's previous four trips from the United States to see Singwin and his family in Lebanon, he had always traveled with a round-trip ticket. When Jarrah departed Miami on July 25th, Atta appears to have driven him to the airport, another unique circumstance. Ben Alshib picked up Jarrah at the airport in Dusseldorf on July 25th. Jarrah went to see Singwin as soon as possible, so he and Ben Alshib arranged to meet a few days later. When they did, they had an emotional conversation during which Ben Alshib encouraged Jarrah to see the plan through. While Jarrah was in Germany, Ben Alshib and Musawi were in contact to arrange for the transfer of funds. Ben Alshib received two wire transfers from Hasawi in the UAE totaling $15,000 and within days relayed almost all of this money to Musawi in two installments. Musawi had been taking flight lessons at the Airman Flight School in Norman, Oklahoma since February but stopped in late May. Although at that point he had only about 50 hours of flight time and no solo flights to his credit, Musawi began making inquiries about flight materials and simulator training for Boeing 747s. On July 10th, he put down a $1,500 deposit for flight simulator training at Pan Am International Flight Academy in Egan, Minnesota, and by the end of the month, he had received a simulator schedule to train from August 13th through August 20th. Musawi also purchased two knives and inquired of two manufacturers of GPS equipment whether their products could be converted for aeronautical use activities that closely resembled those of the 9-11 hijackers during their final preparations for the attacks. On August 10th, shortly after getting the money from Ben Alshib, Musawi left Oklahoma with a friend and drove to Minnesota. Three days later, Musawi paid the $6,800 balance owed for his flight simulator training at Pan Am in cash and began his training. His conduct, however, raised the suspicions of his flight instructor. It was unusual for a student with so little training to be learning to fly large jets without any intention of obtaining a pilot's license or other goal. On August 16th, once the instructor reported his suspicion to the authorities, Musawi was arrested by the INS on immigration charges. KSM denies ever considering Musawi for the planes operation. Instead, he claims that Musawi was slated to participate in a second wave of attacks. KSM also states that Musawi had no contact with Atta, and we are unaware of evidence contradicting this assertion. Yet KSM has also stated that by the summer of 2001, he was too busy with the planes operation to continue planning for any second wave attacks. Moreover, he admits that only three potential pilots were ever recruited for the alleged second wave, Musawi plus two others who by mid-summer of 2001 had backed out of the plot. We therefore believe that the effort to push Musawi forward in August 2001 lends credence to the suspicion that he was being primed as a possible pilot in the immediate planes operation. Ben Alshib says he assumed Musawi was to take his place as another pilot in the 9-11 operation. Recounting a post-9-11 discussion with KSM in Kandahar, Ben Alshib claims KSM mentioned Musawi as being part of the 9-11 operation. Although KSM never referred to Musawi by name, Ben Alshib understood he was speaking of the operative to whom Ben Alshib had wired money. Ben Alshib says KSM did not approve of Musawi, but believes KSM did not remove him from the operation only because Musawi had been selected and assigned by Bin Laden himself. 
KSM did not hear about Moussaoui's arrest until after September 11th. According to Ben Al-Shib, had Bin Laden and KSM learned prior to 9-11 that Moussaoui had been detained, they might have canceled the operation. When Ben Al-Shib discussed Moussaoui's arrest with KSM after September 11th, KSM congratulated himself on not having Moussaoui contact the other operatives, which would have compromised the operation. Moussaoui had been in contact with Ben Al-Shib, of course, but this was not discovered until after 9-11. As it turned out, Moussaoui was not needed to replace Girard. By the time Moussaoui was arrested in mid-August, Girard had returned to the United States from his final trip to Germany, his disagreement with Atta apparently resolved. The operatives began their final preparations for the attacks. Readying the Attacks A week after he returned from meeting Ben Alshib in Spain, Atta traveled to Newark, probably to coordinate with Hazmi and give him additional funds. Atta spent a few days in the area before returning to Florida on July 30th. The month of August was busy, as revealed by a set of contemporaneous Atta bin al sheib communications that were recovered after September 11th. On August 3rd, for example, Atta and bin al sheib discussed several matters, such as the best way for the operatives to purchase plane tickets and the assignment of muscle hijackers to individual teams. Atta and bin al sheib also revisited the question of whether to target the White House. They discussed targets in coded language pretending to be students discussing various fields of study. Architecture referred to the World Trade Center, arts the Pentagon, law the Capitol, and politics the White House. Ben al sheib reminded Atta that Bin Laden wanted to target the White House. Atta again cautioned that this would be difficult. When Ben al sheib persisted, Atta agreed to include the White House, but suggested they keep the Capitol as an alternate target in case the White House proved too difficult. Atta also suggested that the attacks would not happen until after the first week in September, when Congress reconvened. Atta and Ben al sheib also discussed The Friend Who Is Coming as a Tourist, a cryptic reference to candidate hijacker Muhammad al Qatani, mentioned above, whom Hassawi was sending the next day as the last one to complete the group. On August 4th, Atta drove to the Orlando airport to meet Qatani. Upon arrival, however, Katani was denied entry by immigration officials because he had a one-way ticket and little money, could not speak English, and could not adequately explain what he intended to do in the United States. He was sent back to Dubai. Hassawi contacted KSM, who told him to help Katani return to Pakistan. On August 7th, Atta flew from Fort Lauderdale to Newark, probably to coordinate with Hazmi. Two days later, Ahmed al Ghamadi and Abdul Aziz al Omari, who had been living in New Jersey with Hazmi and Hanjour, flew to Miami, probably signifying that the four hijacking teams had finally been assigned. While Atta was in New Jersey, he, Hazmi, and Hanjour all purchased tickets for another set of surveillance flights. Like Shahi, Jara, Atta, and Walid al Sheri before them, Hazmi and Hanjour each flew in first class on the same type of aircraft they would hijack on 9-11, a Boeing 757, and on transcontinental flights that connected to Las Vegas. This time, however, Atta himself also flew directly to Las Vegas, where all three stayed on August 13th to 14th. Beyond Las Vegas's reputation for welcoming tourists, we have seen no credible evidence explaining why, on this occasion and others, the operatives flew to or met in Las Vegas. Through August, the hijackers kept busy with their gym training, and the pilots took frequent practice flights on small rented aircraft. The operatives also began to make purchases suggesting that the planning was coming to an end. In mid-August, for example, they bought small knives that may actually have been used in the attacks. On August 22nd, moreover, Gerard attempted to purchase four GPS units from a pilot shop in Miami. He was able to buy only one unit, which he picked up a few days later when he also purchased three aeronautical charts. Perhaps most significant, however, was the purchase of plane tickets for September 11th. On August 23rd, Atta again flew to Newark, probably to meet with Hazmi and select flights. All 19 tickets were booked and purchased between August 25th and September 5th. It therefore appears that the attack date was selected by the third week of August. This timing is confirmed by Ben al sheib who claims Atta called him with the date in mid-August. 
According to Ben Alshib, Atta used a riddle to convey the date in code, a message of two branches, a slash, and a lollipop. To non-Americans, 11-9 would be interpreted as September 11th. Ben Alshib says he called Atta back to confirm the date before passing it to KSM. KSM apparently received the date from Ben Alshib and a message sent through Ben Alshib's old Hamburg associate, Zachariah Essabar. Both Ben Alshib and KSM claim that Essabar was not privy to the meaning of the message and had no foreknowledge of the attacks. According to Ben Alshib, shortly after the date was chosen, he advised Essabar and another Hamburg associate, Saeed Bahaji, that if they wanted to go to Afghanistan, now was the time because it would soon become more difficult. Essabar made reservations on August 22nd and departed Hamburg for Karachi on August 30th. Bahaji purchased his tickets on August 20th and departed Hamburg for Karachi on September 3rd. Ben Alshib also made arrangements to leave for Pakistan during early September before the attacks, as did Ali and Hassawi, the plot facilitators in the UAE. During these final days, Ben Alshib and Atta kept in contact by phone, email, and instant messaging. Although Atta had forbidden the hijackers to contact their families, he apparently placed one last call to his own father on September 9th. Atta also asked Ben Alshib to contact the family of one hijacker, pass along goodbyes from others, and give regards to KSM. Jara alone appears to have left a written farewell, a sentimental letter to Eisel Sanguin. Hazmi, however, may not have been so discreet. He may have telephoned his former San Diego companion, Modar Abdullah, in late August. Several bits of evidence indicate that others in Abdullah's circle may have received word that something big would soon happen. As noted earlier, Abdullah's behavior reportedly changed noticeably. Prior to September 11th, both he and Yazid al-Salmi suddenly became intent on proceeding with their planned marriages. One witness quotes Salmi as commenting after the 9-11 attacks, I knew they were going to do something, that is why I got married. Moreover, as of August 2001, Iyad Kwaiwish and other employees at the Texaco station where Hazmi had worked suddenly were anticipating attention from law enforcement authorities in the near future. Finally, according to an uncorroborated witness account, early on the morning of September 10th, Abdullah, Osama Awadallah, Omar Bakar Bashat, and others behaved suspiciously at the gas station. According to the witness, after the group met, Awadallah said, It is finally going to happen, as the others celebrated by giving each other high fives. Descent Within the Al-Qaeda Leadership while tactical preparations for the attack were nearing completion, the entire operation was being questioned at the top, as al-Qaeda and the Taliban argued over strategy for 2001. Our focus has naturally been on the specifics of the plane's operation, but from the perspective of bin Laden and Atef, this operation was only one, admittedly key element of their unfolding plans for the year. Living in Afghanistan, interacting constantly with the Taliban, the al-Qaeda leaders would never lose sight of the situation in that country. Bin Laden's consistent priority was to launch a major attack directly against the United States. He wanted the plane's operation to proceed as soon as possible. Midar reportedly told his cousin during the summer of 2001 that Bin Laden was reputed to have remarked, I will make it happen even if I do it by myself. According to KSM, Bin Laden had been urging him to advance the date of the attacks. In 2000, for instance, KSM remembers Bin Laden pushing him to launch the attacks amid the controversy after then-Israeli opposition party leader Ariel Sharon's visit to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. KSM claims Bin Laden told him it would be enough for the hijackers simply to down planes rather than crash them into specific targets. KSM says he resisted the pressure. KSM claims to have faced similar pressure twice more in 2001. According to him, bin Laden wanted the operation carried out on May 12, 2001, seven months to the day after the coal bombing. KSM adds that the 9-11 attacks had originally been envisioned for May 2001. The second time he was urged to launch the attacks early was in June or July 2001, supposedly after bin Laden learned from the media that Sharon would be visiting the White House. 
On both occasions KSM resisted, asserting that the hijacking teams were not ready. Bin Laden pressed particularly strongly for the latter date in two letters, stressing the need to attack early. The second letter reportedly was delivered by Bin Laden's son-in-law, Aus al-Madani. Other evidence corroborates KSM's account. For instance, Midar told his cousin that the attacks were to happen in May, but were postponed twice, first to July, then to September. Moreover, one candidate hijacker remembers a general warning being issued in the Al-Qaeda camps in July or early August, just like the warnings issued two weeks before the coal bombing and ten days before the eventual 9-11 attacks. During the midsummer alert, Al-Qaeda members dispersed with their families, security was increased, and bin Laden disappeared for about 30 days until the alert was cancelled. While the details of the operation were strictly compartmented, by the time of the alert, word had begun to spread that an attack against the United States was coming. KSM notes that it was generally well known by the summer of 2001 that he was planning some kind of operation against the United States. Many were even aware that he had been preparing operatives to go to the United States, leading some to conclude that al-Qaeda was planning a near-term attack on U.S. soil. Moreover, bin Laden had made several remarks that summer, hinting at an upcoming attack and generating rumors throughout the worldwide jihadist community. Bin Laden routinely told important visitors to expect significant attacks against U.S. interests soon, and, during a speech at the al-Farouk camp, exhorted trainees to pray for the success of an attack involving 20 martyrs. Others have confirmed hearing indications of an impending attack and have verified that such news, albeit without specific details, had spread across al-Qaeda. Although bin Laden's top priority apparently was to attack the United States, others had a different view. The Taliban leaders put their main emphasis on the year's military offensive against the Northern Alliance, an offensive that ordinarily would begin in the late spring or summer. They certainly hoped that this year's offensive would finally finish off their old enemies, driving them from Afghanistan. From the Taliban's perspective, an attack against the United States might be counterproductive. It might draw the Americans into the war against them, just when final victory seemed within their grasp. There is evidence that Mullah Omar initially opposed a major al-Qaeda operation directly against the United States in 2001. Furthermore, by July, with word spreading of a coming attack, a schism emerged among the senior leadership of al-Qaeda. Several senior members reportedly agreed with Mullah Omar. Those who reportedly sided with bin Laden included Atef, Suleiman Abu Ghaith, and KSM. But those said to have opposed him were weighty figures in the organization, including Abu Hafs the Mauritanian, Sheikh Saeed al-Masri, and Saif al-Adil. One senior al-Qaeda operative claims to recall bin Laden arguing that attacks against the United States needed to be carried out immediately to support insurgency in the Israeli-occupied territories and protest the presence of U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia. Beyond these rhetorical appeals, bin Laden also reportedly thought an attack against the United States would benefit al-Qaeda by attracting more suicide operatives, eliciting greater donations, and increasing the number of sympathizers willing to provide logistical assistance. Mullah Omar is reported to have opposed this course of action for ideological reasons rather than out of fear of U.S. retaliation. He is said to have preferred for al-Qaeda to attack Jews, not necessarily the United States. KSM contends that Omar faced pressure from the Pakistani government to keep al-Qaeda from engaging in operations outside Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda's chief financial manager, Sheikh Saeed, argued that al-Qaeda should defer to the Taliban's wishes. Another source says that Sheikh Saeed opposed the operation, both out of deference to Omar and because he feared the U.S. response to an attack. Abu Hafs, the Mauritanian, reportedly even wrote bin Laden a message basing opposition to the attacks on the Koran. According to KSM, in late August, when the operation was fully planned, Bin Laden formally notified the Al-Qaeda Shura Council that a major attack against the United States would take place in the coming weeks. When some council members objected, Bin Laden countered that Mullah Omar lacked authority to prevent Al-Qaeda from conducting jihad outside Afghanistan. Though most of the Shura Council reportedly disagreed, Bin Laden persisted. The attacks went forward. The story of dissension within Al-Qaeda regarding the 9-11 attacks is probably incomplete. 
The information on which the account is based comes from sources who were not privy to the full scope of al-Qaeda and Taliban planning. Bin Laden and Atef, however, probably would have known, at least, that the general Taliban offensive against the Northern Alliance would rely on al-Qaeda military support. Another significant al-Qaeda operation was making progress during the summer. A plot to assassinate the Northern Alliance leader, Ahmed Shah Massoud. The operatives, disguised as journalists, were in Massoud's camp and prepared to kill him sometime in August. Their appointment to see him was delayed. But on September 9th, the Massoud assassination took place. The delayed Taliban offensive against the Northern Alliance was apparently coordinated to begin as soon as he was killed, and it got underway on September 10th. As they deliberated earlier in the year, Bin Laden and Atef would likely have remembered that Mullah Omar was dependent on them for the Massoud assassination and for vital support in the Taliban military operations. KSM remembers Atef telling him that al-Qaeda had an agreement with the Taliban to eliminate Massoud, after which the Taliban would begin an offensive to take over Afghanistan. Atef hoped Massoud's death would also appease the Taliban when the 9-11 attacks happened. There are also some scant indications that Omar may have been reconciled to the 9-11 attacks by the time they occurred. Moving to Departure Positions In the days just before 9-11, the hijackers returned leftover funds to al-Qaeda and assembled in their departure cities. They sent the excess funds by wire transfer to Hasawi in the UAE, about $26,000 altogether. The hijackers targeting American Airlines Flight 77 to depart from Dulles migrated from New Jersey to Laurel, Maryland, about 20 miles from Washington, D.C. They stayed in a motel during the first week in September and spent time working out at a gym. On the final night before the attacks, they lodged at a hotel in Herndon, Virginia, close to the airport. Further north, the hijackers targeting United Airlines Flight 93 to depart from Newark gathered in that city from their base in Florida on September 7th. Just after midnight on September 8th through 9th, Gerard received a speeding ticket in Maryland as he headed north on I-95. He joined the rest of his team at their hotel. Otto was still busy coordinating the teams. On September 7th, he flew from Fort Lauderdale to Baltimore, presumably to meet with the Flight 77 team in Laurel. On September 9th, he flew from Baltimore to Boston. By then, Shahi had arrived there, and Atta was seen with him at his hotel. The next day, Atta picked up Omari at another hotel, and the two drove to Portland, Maine, for reasons that remain unknown. In the early morning hours of September 11th, they boarded a commuter flight to Boston to connect to American Airlines Flight 11. The two spent their last night pursuing ordinary activities, making ATM withdrawals, eating pizza, and shopping at a convenience store. Their three fellow hijackers for Flight 11 stayed together in a hotel in Newton, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Shahi and his team targeting United Airlines Flight 175 from Logan Airport spent their last hours at two Boston hotels. The plan that started with a proposal by KSM in 1996 had evolved to overcome numerous obstacles. Now 19 men waited in nondescript hotel rooms to board four flights the next morning. End of Chapter 7.4 The 9-11 Commission Report Chapter 7.4 Final Strategies and Tactics Final Preparations in the United States During the early summer of 2001, Atta, assisted by Shahi, was busy coordinating the arrival of most of the muscle hijackers in southern Florida, picking them up at the airport, finding them places to stay, and helping them settle in the United States. The majority settled in Florida. Some opened bank accounts, acquired mailboxes, and rented cars. Several also joined local gyms, presumably to stay fit for the operation. Upon first arriving, most stayed in hotels and motels, but by mid-June they settled in shared apartments relatively close to one another and Atta. Though these muscle at the same time, at Air Fleet Training Systems in Teterboro, New Jersey, where he started receiving ground instruction soon after settling in the area with Hazmi. Hanjur flew the Hudson Corridor, but his instructor declined a second request because of what he considered Hanjur's poor piloting skills. Shortly thereafter, Hanjur switched to Caldwell Flight Academy in Fairfield, New Jersey, 
where he rented small aircraft on several occasions during June and July. In one such instance on July 20th, Hanjour, likely accompanied by Hazmi, rented a plane from Caldwell and took a practice flight from Fairfield to Gaithersburg, Maryland, a route that would have allowed them to fly near Washington, D.C. Other evidence suggests that Hanjour may even have returned to Arizona for flight simulator training earlier in June. Atta and Shahi, a Boeing 767, Jarrah, a Boeing 757. Hanjour and Hazmi, as noted below, took similar cross-country surveillance flights in August. Jarrah and Hanjour also received additional training and practice flights in the early summer. A few days before departing on his cross-country test flight, Jarrah flew from Fort Lauderdale to Philadelphia, where he trained at Hortman Aviation and asked to fly the Hudson Corridor, a low-altitude hallway along the Hudson River that passes New York landmarks like the World Trade Center. Heavy traffic in the area can make the corridor a dangerous route for an inexperienced pilot. Because Hortman deemed Jarrah unfit to fly solo, he could fly this route only with an instructor. Hanjour, too, requested to fly the Hudson Corridor about hijackers did not travel much after arriving in the United States. Two of them, Walid al Sheri and Satam al Sakami, took unusual trips. On May 19th, Sheri and Sakami flew from Fort Lauderdale to Freeport, the Bahamas, where they had reservations at the Bahamas Princess Resort. The two were turned away by Bahamian officials on arrival, however, because they lacked visas. They returned to Florida that same day. They likely took this trip to renew Sukami's immigration status, as Sukami's legal stay in the United States ended May 21st. On July 30th, Cherie traveled alone from Fort Lauderdale to Boston. He flew to San Francisco the next day, where he stayed one night before returning via Las Vegas. While this travel may have been a casing flight, Cherie traveled in first class on the same type of aircraft he would help hijack on September 11th, a Boeing 767, and the trip included a layover in Las Vegas. Cherie was neither a pilot nor a plot leader, as were the other hijackers who took surveillance flights. The three Hamburg pilots, Atta, Shahi, and Jarrah, took the first of their cross-country surveillance flights early in the summer. Shahi flew from New York to Las Vegas via San Francisco in late May. Jarrah flew from Baltimore to Las Vegas via Los Angeles in early June. Atta flew from Boston to Las Vegas via San Francisco at the end of June. Each traveled in first class on United Airlines. For the east-west transcontinental leg, each operative flew on the same type of aircraft he would pilot on September 11th. 